Lyon, France. It's known for its food, but as we found out, there's a lot more to do than just eat. You're listening to Travel FOMO, a podcast for people self-diagnosed with wanderlust. Hey guys, I'm Hillary Halton and you are listening to Travel FOMO and I'm here with my husband and fellow foodie, Jamin. I am Jamin. <laughs> and today <laughs> we are talking about a French city that might seem a little intimidating to some people. I know it was for me, Lyon, France. Yeah, very, very high on intimidation when it yes. comes to French cuisine. Yes, due to the French cuisine. It has more than 20 Michelin star restaurants. And it's really famous for, we've, you know, in my head, I kept thinking it's famous for being the culinary capital of the world. But when you really do your research, you find out that it's famous for its gastronomy. And it's been named the gastronomic the gastronomic capital of the world since 1935, which is a really long time. That is a really long time to be on top. And now what is the difference between those two? Yeah, so the difference between gastronomy and culinary arts is that gastronomy is all about eating the food, the food plus the culture, you know, combining all those things. What does that look like? And culinary is more about cooking and preparing the food and actually being behind the scenes and making that food. So I guess you could think about it as like, you know, we're not qualified to like make that amazing food, but we're definitely qualified to eat it. <laughs> we're less on the culinary side and more on the gastronomic. Just give me the food and the culture side. Yeah. I mean, that really works out well for us. Yeah. That's a great plan for me. Yeah. I buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us, I know you looked into this and you were telling me about how Lyon is in a very specific part of the country that kind of makes it extra special. Yes. Yeah, so the reason so many great chefs have come from Lyon and uh, it's known so much for its food, has all those Michelin restaurants is because of its location. So it's in the southern part of France. So not the far south France, so not the French Riviera on the coast, but north of that, um, but still in southern France, but right kind of where everything converges. So you have the butter and potatoes from northern Europe. Mm -hmm. You still have those influences because it's far enough north. And you have the uh, olive oil and tomatoes from Italy and those southern influences that come up. It's on a huge river, so there's uh, access to a lot of food um, through trade that a okay. lot of places don't have. It's at the foothills of the Alps, so there's access to beef and cheese as well as lamb from those uh, rolling hills of the Alps. There's also a huge lake region that's close, so there's a lot of duck there. And then um, there's a lot of poultry in that uh, area as well because it doesn't get as cold. So it's, it's easier to raise um, farm animals like chickens and pigs and things like that. So sort of all of the stuff that you want from food is all in that area. And so it all kind of converges along with all these different influences because it was a trade route. So everything kind of comes together and produces this place that has all of this really amazing food. And that's kind of what it's known for. That is so cool. It's like the diversity of like landscape and everything and cultures just kind of makes it this beautiful mesh of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes together. Everybody's got a hand in the pot and everybody's making it a little bit better. Yeah. I love that. And one thing that you know, it's crossed my mind is like, why Lyon? Why not like Paris? But everything you just said confirms that Lyon is the place to, to be when it comes to food in France. Yeah. It's just in that perfect spot geographically for everything to be fresh and awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, the other thing I think is so interesting and that we kind of looked into a little bit more was the whole idea of Michelin star restaurants being such a big deal there. And it got me thinking about the brand Michelin and I was like, you know, that's kind of like that Michelin tires and that like that big, like marshmallow looking the Michelin, Michelin man. man. 
Yeah. yeah. And um, and I was like, wouldn't that be funny if, you know, the, if they're just two totally different things. But then I looked into it and they are the same. It's the same brand that brings you tires <laughs> is the brand that brings you these Michelin stars associated with food. Yeah, I Which was is amazed. so cool. I was amazed by that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, um, and, and Jamin, you jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong on anything, but my understanding is that like the reason that it's, they call them Michelin stars is because the Michelin brand that created tires was they got into publishing maps and then they got into publishing guidebooks for travelers. And then before you know it, people are wondering, you know, where do I eat when I'm traveling? So then they would start rating all of these restaurants by stars in order to, um, you know, help their customers out. But then also at the same time, it's basically keeping their brand relevant to people mm. who are traveling and it's encouraging people to travel and it's wearing out those tires <laughs> and it's making people, you drive in their cars more, wear out their tires and get more tires and I just think it's fascinating because I've never put the two, two and two together like that. Yeah, it was so cool to to kind of learn that. And when you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. But I was just like you. I was like, there's no way they're associated. But like, what an amazing way to keep in contact with your customers mm -hmm. at the point where they don't need you. Like, yeah. they've bought their tires. They're good. But you offer them this service where they stay engaged with you. and also wear out their tires and then need no tires. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that is just so well done. And I just applaud Michelin for that idea alone. Yeah, and genius. if more brands would make themselves relevant and just be willing to think outside the box, like imagine what they would do and what they'd be known for. Kind of right. Crazy. Well, I mean, you, you have to realize that at some point someone walked into a meeting at a tire company and was like, hey, I got an idea. How about we rate restaurants? Yeah. And they were forward enough thinking to say like, yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Yeah. Love it. Oh my goodness. I love it. Okay. So we were on a shoestring budget, a gap yes. year budget <laughs> <laughs> while we were traveling. So we did not actually dine at any of the Michelin star restaurants there. Full disclosure. That's not what you're going to hear in this <laughs> podcast. Um, but Jamin, you had some good tips for people that were coming to eat in Lyon and in France. And just in light of how complicated those menus can be when you're reading something in French and it's just a whole nother level. Would you kind of give some of the tips that you've mentioned? Yeah. So we went like we went back and forth um, because of budget on deciding like, are we going to go all out? and spend a lot of money to eat at a really nice restaurant. And we ultimately opted not to, not to spend our money that way. We felt like we would just be better off like saving that money for something else because we don't really know that much about food. But um, if you are going to go to Lyon for the food, um, you, you probably already know some of this, but it might be a little bit helpful it's pretty intimidating. Like the food scene in France in particular is pretty intimidating because there's not going to be um, English menus or mm -hmm. things like that. Like you might see in other places in Europe, a lot of places have an English menu here or there, or maybe like maybe it's prominent, especially in touristy areas. So it's not hard to find an English menu in most of Europe um, in the big cities, but in France, it is not that way. It's all in French and it's a lot of food that even if you translate it, like let's say you get your phone out and you translate all the words, it doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're an American, it's a lot of stuff that you've never heard of. Right. And so I feel like when I go to a restaurant, I look at the ingredients of a dish and I can pretty well figure out I'm going to like that or not like that based on how it's prepared and what all is coming with it. In France, it's so much stuff that I just no clue, right? no clue to where to even start. I mean, even just the different types of cheeses, like I'd be like, uh, I know a lot of cheeses because I like <laughs> some cheese, but I'm at a loss. Yeah. And, and just like endless amounts of 
man, I don't know. I don't know what any of this is. Mm -hmm. And so you either end up ordering something just random that you're just like, yeah, I'll take that one and just like hoping for the best. Or you end up with like a Caesar salad because you just don't know what else to do. A few things to keep in mind, like really research the restaurant that you want to go to make reservations well in advance mm -hmm. um, because they fill up fast. It's hard to get into the nice restaurants in yeah. Lyon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially Lyon where people come for the food. Yeah. Like a lot of people are there to eat at these amazing restaurants. And so make sure that you're, that you're booked up and research those menus so that, you know, before you go in like the wine that you want mm -hmm. and the appetizer you want and the main dish you want and you can just order it as as easily as possible because otherwise if you're like me you get in there you get super intimidated and you and you just like start taking the path of least resistance mm. and you're like i guess i'll just order i'll just have the special mm -hmm. yeah. you're like whatever you just said i'll just have that rather than trying to like dive into it and yeah. you often don't end up with the experience that you were looking for especially if you're going to spend a lot of money at a really nice restaurant. Yeah, for sure. Great tips. Yeah. What did you, what did you think was like the favorite place that you ate at whenever we were there? In Leon? Um, I really liked the food hall. Mm. Um, cause we had, we had something really simple. We had a charcuterie board, but, um, we went to, um, it was La Halle's de Leon Paul Bocuse. Now, how do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul Bocuse was a famous chef from Lyon. Um, he's very well known. Um, if you look him up, there'll be a hundred like travel shows about going to his restaurant. Um, I know I I watched a couple with Anthony Bourdain where he's just psyched to be where Paul Bocuse cooked and um, he did get really pumped about that, which tells you something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it, uh, it's, it's next level, but they have this, this huge food hall. That's a fresh food market as well as like uh, little kind of booths with different stuff where you can get stuff to eat. You could go there a million times and eat a million different things. They have everything from fresh fruit to chocolate to full on meals all kinds of stuff, desserts, all of it. And we stopped at a place and had a charcuterie board that was really, really good. Um, I think that that place, probably just for the experience of like walking through and seeing all the different food, smelling all the different smells, like having some decent food, that was probably my favorite place that we ate while we were there, which was just a food hall, which tells you kind of the level that I'm at. Yeah. gastronomically well and we only had a charcuterie board and some wine like yeah. we didn't even have anything like elaborate but it was really good and it was a fun experience yeah for yeah. sure what was your favorite of the, of was, the food place yeah mine was probably the same but i will give a shout out to um la commune which was mm -hmm. a community food hall but it was more like a um incubator like yes. a culinary incubator you you could call it um so there were little um uh culinary inventors coming up with creative new ways of cultural foods and so um you could kind of try a bunch of different foods from a bunch of different cultures yeah the irony is that we walk in the door and we meet a girl from dallas who went to school <laughs> in richardson which is we lived in dallas worked in richardson um it was such a small world and she was super friendly and mm -hmm. we just really you know it's nice to see like a friendly face especially in france where you can't we have trouble speaking that language more so it's harder to engage people and yeah. um and you don't see as much maybe um people engaging you either because they're like oh yeah you don't speak this so <laughs> right but yeah. um but oh my gosh i will never forget being there and you had like a great salad i mm. had um some kind of mediterranean plate with a bunch of different hummuses and falafels and stuff like that but I went up to this like wall. They had like this wall that you could like basically order, kind of use a machine to order your own beer and pour your own beer. 
right. and thinking this is fun. And everything was in French. That is the thing about France too, is that like, there's not a lot of like, hey, here is here it is in English. And a lot right. of other countries are a little more English friendly, but not mm. France. And so um, everything was in French. I could not figure out how to get this thing to work. I even like watched other people and I was like, I don't know what this <laughs> says. And it's way too many words on here for me to decipher this. And I kind of gave up. I should have asked the girl from Dallas if she could help me, but I was over it at a certain point but um <laughs> but yeah people were like looking we're filming me do this so yep. you you guys can go watch the video to see how ridiculous i look <laughs> but i just went on and on trying to get this beer because i was really dedicated because you know it was beer so i was like pretty committed to it <laughs> and finally i was like okay yeah we're just gonna walk away <laughs> <laughs> so sad <laughs> so I do, sad i do remember standing there filming and if especially for us because we're we're new at it we're not like the most proficient youtubers in the right. whole world and so when you're filming it does feel like everybody's looking at you and it feels like things take hours right that really are only taking seconds but you feel like this has been going on forever and i've been on display this whole time and <laughs> we're like filming you and it was funny for a while. And then I kind of started feeling a little bit bad for you because it was just like, was not working? <laughs> While your own face was getting really red. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were both like, oh, just cringing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then we went to another restaurant um, at another point called La Cuisine. And it was OK. It wasn't anything to really write home about. But we were like on a mission. They like try Leon foods and stuff um but we had some really interesting stuff there like um I had the veal mm -hmm. um you had and I had creme brulee oh the creme brulee actually was really good I do it came out in like a, good, yeah. a hot iron um a black iron skillet kind of thing yeah and yeah it was really really good it wasn't like outstanding do you remember what you had you had like a cheese soup <laughs> I had like, I had some roasted cheese. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't honestly don't remember what else. It was one of those situations where I'll just order this mm -hmm. and hope that I like it. And it was just, it was just okay. Yeah. The service was great and people mm -hmm. were really friendly. Yes. Um, so like the, the place seemed awesome. We had some nice wine while we we're in there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just being so far off from being able to understand the menu. It made it was, hard. Yeah. Yeah, it just which proves your point. Out. You got to do your research and make it count. And that was an instance where, you know, we really, really didn't do that. We really didn't do our part. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't didn't look deeply enough into yeah into that well also we kind of it was recommended it was one of the places recommended by our airbnb host mm -hmm. but um it's just one of those places where you know it's one of those things where you think you could go to a city that's known for the best food ever and you're just gonna get the best food ever no matter where you go but that's right. not necessarily the case and he pointed that out to us he said mm -hmm. not every place is good do not go to the one down below your apartment do <laughs> right. not go to that one it's not good um and so he would kind of acknowledge that like just because you know people think leon has every restaurant is amazing here that's not necessarily the case um so unfortunately i think this is one he recommended but yeah i i think we just didn't know what to order and yeah. french food is just so different that i i think you would have to have it for a while to develop an appreciation for it um i think it's just it's just one of those things that like that you need to have kind of over and over again to yeah. really understand like okay this is what i like this is how i like it and you know i i think it's kind of one of those things like steak if you're if you're a fan of a really good steak, you've probably had a bunch of steaks at a bunch of different places. And it probably took a while for you to figure out like, OK, this is the cut I like. This is how I like it cooked. These places are going to be able to do it well. These places that are kind of cheaper aren't going to be able to do it well. And it it takes a while to learn and it's expensive. So. You know, it, it might take a bit to like really figure it out if you don't have those like 
gastronomic chops down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, one of the other things that really surprised me about Lyon is that um, it, the personality of the city was so different. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I expected it to be a little snooty because it was um, because it is so much about like these great restaurants and great foods and I just expected it to be like maybe a little snotty (laughs) but it was really welcoming really friendly the people were so hospitable I Mm -hmm. mean honest to goodness this was the it had the friendliest people that in all of Europe I would say that we went to in three months the people were the friendliest and they spoke French they didn't even speak English and they would find a way yeah like it it, I would, I would agree. And we ran into a lot of really friendly people in a lot of places, but I do think that Lyon probably takes the cake. Yeah, for sure. Um, we went to several spots where we were just shopping and you were like looking for stuff in the store and I was just kind of standing around and like the clerk behind the counter would start a conversation with me and were really genuinely interested in us and what we're doing and wanted us to really like their city, wanted us to have a good time, made good recommendations, like super nice. Yeah. Okay. So I did make a note to myself that we actually, within a couple hours of arriving, we already had like five people engage us in in full on conversation and ask where we were from. They wanted to know about us. And then on top of that, um, you know, I'm, I think it, earlier I mentioned something about them not speaking English very well, but I actually made a note that they were pretty fluent in English and maybe that's why they engaged us and they wanted to practice their English with us. Like they <laughs> wanted to talk to us in English. It was just very different from Paris. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even down to the Airbnbs, like we tried to get self check in whenever possible and it wasn't possible in Paris or in Lyon. And in Paris, we had somebody meet us Mm -hmm. and kind of go over the rules of the apartment Mm -hmm. and um, what like what we needed to do and what we weren't allowed to do and all of this stuff. And then insisted on meeting us as we left to like inspect the apartment Mm -hmm. and make sure that nothing was broken and all. And it felt very much like. Like dad's here to like check on us and make sure that we don't do anything wrong Mm -hmm. and in Lyon it was the exact opposite (laughs) like the guy wanted us to have a great time he was only there to show us the apartment so that we would know everything that there was to it and how to use it all and all of these recommendations and he he was super nice and like, Oh, please, please this and that. And I'll let me know if there's anything I can do and all of the just overly nice at like the exact opposite of the Paris experience. That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, and speaking of our Airbnb, it was so interesting. Our host was fabulous. He left a card for us and everything, like, mm-hmm. you know, welcoming us. And, and he had all these business cards of all of the places he recommends. He had business cards. So you could grab a business card and take it with you out the door as you were going out to see the city. Um, he had great advice. He talked with us for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, whenever it was all said and done, he was willing to let us like stay longer in the Airbnb and everything. Like it was just no big deal. Like yeah. whatever you need. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, very cool. But the inside of it was like super artsy <laughs> and very um, eclectically decorated. I loved it and was like hardcore about it, like from the minute I saw it online. <laughs> but it was so funny. Because the bedroom was really interesting. It was. So the bedroom like had basically two two doors on either side of it. And then the bed ran like the full length of the room. So mm-hmm. like wall to wall. Yeah. So there's kind of like walkways on the sides of the bed and then walls at the foot and head of the bed. And they had all this art on it. And it was this black and white sort of drawing art. And it looked like like black ink tattoos it really it was like sleeping inside of a tattoo <laughs> like you everywhere you look it's just like oh that i i feel like i'm in a tattoo right now 
You said that and I cracked up and I could never forget that. I can never get that out of my head now. I'm like, it's like sleeping inside a tattoo. And that was literally what it felt like. It just felt like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like hard to calm your mind down when you're looking at these walls. <laughs> right. But yeah, it has a crazy cool apartment in a super old building um, above a square. It kind of overlooked the square where there's a lot of restaurants. And so like, like all of France, it, you know, at night tables and awnings come out and it fills with people and noise and which is just what you're there for. Yeah. And, you know, we were two or three stories up and it had these huge windows that opened up and all of that was just all right there. Yeah. You felt like you were a part of it inside the apartment, which was super cool. Yeah. But then at the same time, there was like really old pieces to it and really modern pieces to it. Like mm -hmm. some of the ways he decorated was really modern. It had like a washing machine. It had yeah, that was um, nice. a dishwasher too, I think. And like it just, you really felt taken care of. He had coffees for us and little candies for us and stuff like that and milk. Um, mm -hmm. which I always appreciated whenever somebody left us milk, which is just, it, it can be annoying to go out and buy it. So it's always nice when someone leaves it. And I'm pretty sure he was one of the people who left some for us. Yeah. And, and he even left us some of those little, they, and Leon is famous for these, um, they're like almonds, but they're covered with this like pink candy coating. Mm. And it's like a famous thing there. And he left us like a small jar of them. Oh, yeah. Because uh, he it, wanted us to have them. And, yeah. It looks like little pink popcorn. Yeah. Is what it looks like. Yeah. But it's like super candy ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was like, it was just really nice. And then I love the old parts of it and how there were like the winding staircase. It was like this stone concrete, you know, really old winding staircase that takes you up. I'm really dark, old. Like you felt you were like you were in a castle. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then there was an elevator too, but you could only fit like one person in the elevator. So I think when he showed us up, he let me ride in the elevator and then you guys walked up because none <laughs> of us, we couldn't all get on the elevator. Yeah. Yeah. I followed him up um, the winding staircase. Yeah. Yeah. That might've been the smallest elevator actually. We saw a ton of small elevators mm -hmm. and that one could only fit one of us. So I don't think I ever got in that one because it was so small. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah, I think that must have been. That must have been the smallest elevator. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, so one of the things we always do when we're traveling to new places is we always, especially in Europe, um, we try to go on a run while we're there. Yep. And we try to do it on the first morning because we know we'll be too tired if we wait. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. So we try to check the box early. <laughs> um, but it also shows us so much about the city that we're about to discover. And we kind of get to start discovering it right away. And that was such an epic run. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. I was so excited to get back to running because when we were in Austria and Switzerland, we had done hikes. Oh, right. Which yeah. were great too. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really excited to get back into a morning run. And this one was incredible. It was so cool. Like we just had these amazing views of the city because we ran up to the Basilica, which we also had this great view of the Basilica from our apartment window, which was really cool. Um, and it sits up on this hill along the side of the river. And it is just really majestic I guess you could say yeah it was yeah. just really powerful and so we went up there it was like crazy early in the morning like nobody was around so we really I mean literally I don't remember seeing people no. hardly no we have it to ourselves they say on a clear day you can actually see the Alps from up there which I don't know that we did but <laughs> I think I would have remembered but but it did take a little work to get up there it was like 79 flights of stairs yeah Flights of stairs, not 79 flights. stairs, 79 flights. It was uh, strenuous. Yeah. <laughs> when you're planning a trip, what are the tools you use? Have you ever thought about a better way? To plan more efficiently, to save money, optimize time? We all have some kind of limits on our resources, time, money, energy. Let's find a way to make the most of them. Let's find a way to help each other take the best possible memories with us when we head home from our journey. If your product does that, let's get together and share it here. 
then we went along the river to some Roman theater ruins. So Mm -hmm. if you imagine like some huge amphitheaters, there was actually two. And then later on, I even found out there's others in Lyon, at least one other one. But we went um, to ancient theater of Vior. Um, We'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) So you don't have to rely on my incredible um, pronunciation. (laughs) They still use those amphitheaters today. And I think that's so cool because while we were there, they were like literally setting up for a concert. Yeah. It's crazy. I Yeah. It made me really want to go to a show there. I mean, to see (laughs) anything, a, a concert, a play or whatever. Yeah. In one of those old Roman theaters would be incredible. Like people yeah. have been gathering there for that kind of stuff for so long. That would that would just be so cool. Yeah. Well, we actually found out later that the city dates back to 43 BC. So before Christ, 43 years before Christ, this city was had been founded. Yeah. So that's pretty incredible and it does tell you like the history there there was just just the fact that there were roman runs everywhere was really crazy but um but there was another good running option and that yes. was a park what's the name of that park um it was park de la tete dior um, thank you for that <laughs> and, <laughs> um, it's a huge city park um we didn't even really know about it um, until our Airbnb host told us about it and a couple other like random people that we met told us about it. Mm-hmm. And so we went to check it out in the afternoon. Incredible. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> I was shocked because I was like, okay, it's just going to be another park, which is going to be great. But it was like a hike for us. Like it wasn't close. Yeah. It was a ways away. And, um, that's, I think that's kind of why we hadn't even really it wasn't on our radars because we'd kind of looked True. at a map and been and like when we did see where it was, we we're like, man, that's kind of ways out there. But another gift from our um, Airbnb host, mm-hmm. he left us two uh, one way tickets for the metro system. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we took it out there to the park and walked around um, botanical gardens, a massive park, just huge park, yeah. a huge, uh, rose garden, mm-hmm. um, a lake. There's a zoo yeah. in the park, a free zoo and like legit zoo. Um, mm-hmm. we're not talking about like one enclosure with like a flamingo in it. We're talking about like crocodiles and giraffes and zebras and deer and all kinds of stuff just out there in this park and mm-hmm. of course it's a park in Europe so it's full of people yeah just hanging out and having a good time um it was so cool definitely that, if you're yeah. in the own go check it out yeah that was like one of the coolest things I I remember thinking like the fact that they make this available to people mm-hmm. of any by any means if you can get yourself physically there it's yours yeah I just thought that was really really cool and I'm surprised that there aren't more free zoos you know in america you know because it's such a a child-centric thing it's such a family-centric thing Mm -hmm. it's such a service to your community you know yeah yeah i i agree i wish there was more of that here um it was such a cool spot and would be an amazing run Mm -hmm. um if you don't want to do all the flights of stairs to the basilica yes (laughs) literally we were like oh my gosh we wish we would have we would have run here too that was awesome. Um, but of course, a trip to Lyon or to any city is really not complete without a walking tour. And we've really been finding this out for sure. As we yeah. look back over all these different places we've been, the places that we seem to be really attached to and really love are the ones that we took a tour in. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of other places where we're like, well, we didn't really, oh, like that was, it was okay. We didn't learn about that city in the same way because we didn't go on a tour. Right. So um, here, though, we got a great tour guide. Um, he was this guy from the Netherlands, and um, and he really made it worth it. Um, and so, I mean, oh, gosh, where do we even begin? There's so much that yeah. we learned. <laughs> it was incredible. But the thing that really blew me away right off the bat is he tells you how old the city is. It dates back to 43 B.C. Crazy. Um, and it's it still has its old city center. Mm-hmm. 
like a lot of the old city is still there. So that's a pretty big deal and it makes it different than a lot of other French cities. Um, so I just think that was pretty fascinating too. Yeah. The, the fact that it's still intact and you can see it Mm -hmm. was really cool. And there is like newer, um, parts of the city. Uh, and we actually walked to some of them, uh, on our walking tour, but the, the old part of Lyon is still there and is still the way it was Mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago. So yeah, it's it's really unique in that way and really cool that way. Yeah. And then one of the things that made it such a successful city was there is an aqueduct or there there was. I actually don't know if it's still something that they use, but um, it was 85 kilometers long, I believe. It mm-hmm. started 30 minutes outside of the city and it would bring water into the city and all the way up the hill to where the basilica was. Yeah. Which was like a huge feat and a big deal and and having water you know it was it's a city on a river but it might actually be on two rivers actually now that i think about it but it's a city on water um and then they're bringing this water up the hill they just made really good use of water right off the bat and it made the city thrive and um i think this might have been one of the places where we either learned or the guide reiterated to us that you know, there's this cathedral there and that cathedral, and this is just such a, this was a new thing for me, you know, when we went on this trip is that cathedrals, there's only one cathedral in every city and it is mm-hmm. the most important church. So you might see a lot of different churches, a lot of different chapels, but you're only going to see one cathedral in every city. Um, so I just thought that's like pretty pretty fascinating and the church plays such a big role in France's in Lyon's history yes it was uh it was kind of the first church in France uh in the the remains of the first church are still there and you can actually still see the baptistry um because the the baptistry was built outside the church because you had to uh, be a Christian to go into the church and so many people were converting that they had a baptistry outside so that you could become a Christian, be baptized, and then oh. you were allowed to enter the church. I um, don't think that I caught that or I forgot that if I did. Yeah, that's why the, they had that baptistry outside. That's also why in Florence they built St. Michael's Baptistry separate from the Duomo like is because they would have people baptized there so that then they could go into the church. Wow, that's really cool. It it makes a lot of sense, you know, when you when you think about it that way. Um, yeah, so all of this dates back to when Christianity Christianity first became legal in France. Yes. Um, which was a really big deal and um and actually the bishop of Lyon is um the bishop that holds the highest title of all of them in all of France. Yeah, which is crazy when you think about Paris and like Notre Dame and and all of that that that's in Paris and other places that like Lyon still holds that significance um, in the Catholic Church is pretty cool. Yeah, that is. And then there were just all kinds of little tidbits that we learned along the way. Like he talked about how the architecture here, it has some of some Tuscany influences, mm-hmm. which we'd already noticed. Yeah. It felt a little Italian there. And um, and they say that it's because the Italians moved here and they got homesick. <laughs> and so they decided to like build homes the way that they used to build homes and make them look like that. So I thought that was fun. Yeah, it does make it a beautiful city and gives it that like that European feel that and it does like feel very very Italian, which was yeah. really cool. And another part of the architecture was the, I think that it's called Trebols. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's these passageways in the buildings, like between buildings and through buildings and things like that, that are not obvious and they're sort of secret mm-hmm. and they've all got these doors on them. And it's these passageways that if you don't know they're there, it just looks like another door. Yeah. And um, our, our guide like walked us through a couple of them. Um, they're not so secret anymore. <laughs> Once <laughs> the were, tourists start coming yeah, through. There were a bunch of tours and there, there are river tours that come like river cruises 
that come through and stop at Lyon and there were a bunch that day. And so there were a bunch of like cruise ship people, um, all throughout the city while we were trying to take this walking tour. But, uh, these little passageways and tunnels were, uh, really critical during world war two mm-hmm. because the locals knew all about them. And when, uh, Lyon was occupied by the Nazis, they would use these tunnels to escape and like and meet in secret and then could just be gone. Because if you're not from there, you don't know, you have no idea where they go right. and how to use them. But locals can get anywhere very quickly using these tribbles, which was fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And we'll get back to World War II history in a minute, too, because there's more that Leon has like a really big history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in World War Two. But um it, the thing that's so fascinating too is that like okay so they're secret like you don't really know if you're not from there you wouldn't know that it's there mm-hmm. but there are they are historic so they've started putting plaques on them so you can like that is kind of a a um a way of recognizing them mm-hmm. and then one other really fun you know secret fact that he <laughs> told us about was that before noon every day you can access them you can like get in easily by yourself because the um uh the postal service they have to deliver mail and so they all of the passageways are unlocked so that you can get in and deliver mail before noon every day anyway i just thought that was like all you do is click a little button and you get to go in (laughs) yeah yeah there's a little access button and before noon you can actually get into them so if you're up early walking around and you see one with a plaque or something you want to check it out you can just click the little button and do it we'll see and it's another example i wish we took this tour but we didn't take it soon enough because we'd already gone on our run that morning yeah we could have like on our run we could have like run through some of the secret passageways yeah that would have been cool so leon is also really well known for its silk which Mm -hmm. i had no idea about yeah me either so (laughs) we we did learn that on the tour and we actually got to see some silkworms in action making like you know their their silk i guess yeah (laughs) so that was kind of interesting and then um and then we went to um the house of justice basically the courthouse there um and i don't know if they pronounce it place of justice or play of palais palais of justice maybe i think so palais of justice (laughs) i'm gonna i'm crossing my fingers hoping for that but it's the courthouse with 24 columns is how you say it in english (laughs) (laughs) and um this has been a place of justice since the 10th century a really long time yeah that's crazy to think about. Like people have been judged and um, sentenced in there for so long. Yeah. That's crazy. Like a millennium. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's crazy. On on that spot, there's been justice doled out for, mm-hmm. for that long. And it's an incredible thing about Europe is seeing places like that that are still being used for the same thing that they've been used for for thousands of years is fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Tell everyone about the case that is so well known that goes back to World War II. Yeah, so there's um, this is something that you may have heard about. I know it's been in a couple of movies, I believe. I think there's even um, the Nazi Hunters Amazon show. I think there's an episode about it, but um, it's of the Gestapo officer Klaus Barbie and he was known as the butcher of Lyon um, due to his cruelty he enjoyed um, torturing people personally Mm -hmm. um, especially Jews Um, there was a at one point like 44 orphan Jews that he sent off and they were never heard from again Um, and at the at the just a <clears throat> a really horrible person and committed all these tr- all these crimes and at the end of the war he went into hiding in Bolivia uh, was eventually caught and then um, years later right like a long time later yeah I, th- I think it was in, like in the 70s crazy when he finally was caught and taken back to Lyon uh, to face trial and he was given the ma- the maximum sentence of life in prison 
And, um, and I read too that he had like 341 charges against him. Yeah. That's a ton. Yeah. And like in, in, in this article, they were talking about how they read aloud all of these charges, which I cannot, that would probably be the hardest part of that whole case is having to listen to the charges against him. Yeah. It's such a, such a reminder of, of what happened in that Mm -hmm. part of the world. Yeah. And as Americans were so far removed from world war Mm two, like we obviously get taught about it in history and a lot of us have family that served. And, um, so it is a big deal here, but it happened there. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff like this that really reminds you of, of that. And, and it's just lasting impacts on that part of the world. And it's, um, it's just so crazy to learn about when you're there and actually see in person. Yeah. Yeah, that was um that was crazy. And right across the river from there was a statue that really was powerful mm-hmm. as well and it was called the weight of oneself. Yeah. Do you remember that? I do. I remember seeing it on our run. Yeah. And kind of being struck by it. And I remember looking at it on our run and being like sort of amazed Mm -hmm. and then when we came back through on the walking tour and our guide told us about it a little bit um it just made so much more sense but it's it's a man and he's standing there and in his in his arms he's holding basically the collapsed body of a man but it is him holding himself and so he's he's holding himself and the weight of oneself and um i don't know i was just really struck by it as like wow but so much of of what we do is just carrying ourselves through life and all the baggage that i have in me Mm -hmm. is clearly all that i can handle yeah yeah and you just see it in this statue and you're like wow that is so so um i don't know uh, poignant i guess Mm -hmm. yeah and they've got it displayed so nicely it's this white big white statue on display right alongside the river so you've got the blue river right behind it Mm -hmm. and it like stands out from it and it just really feels prominent and powerful it's um yeah, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Well, we learned some valuable lessons while we were in Lyon. <laughs> we learned some interesting things, and we yes. learned one really valuable lesson about traveling in France. <laughs> <laughs> know your local holidays. Yes. The national holidays of the country that you're in, because they're not the same as American holidays. <laughs> and you would be surprised how many times you might run into that. And we ran into Ascension Day. Right. And it impacted a lot of our plans in France. We were using the Eurowell Pass to get around. And so we didn't buy our train tickets in advance. Um, we would typically just a couple days out, look at the train schedules, find a train that we wanted to be on, and book it through the app, basically. Well, in France, you have to have seat reservations. And in France, you also have to make those seat reservations at the train station. Mm-hmm. Um We learned this the hard way in Paris. Um, and We're really good at learning things the hard way. We can learn things really well, guys. It just has to be the hard way. Yeah, the hard way. It just has to smack us in the face. In the face. And we thought um, this shouldn't be difficult to go from Lyon to Bordeaux. They're only a few hours apart. If you look, there are trains that run pretty regularly most of the time. But we failed to calculate that Ascension Day was a holiday, a national holiday, a bank holiday, and it meant that there weren't as many trains, and it also meant that there were more people traveling Mm -hmm. to celebrate the holiday. And so getting a seat reservation was basically impossible. It was crazy. The guy (laughs) at the train station that looked at us when we said this, he was just like, no, like, no, that's not happening. Like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not going tomorrow. Like, neither one of you. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you're you're not going from Leon to Bordeaux tomorrow. Like, 
we kind of have to because we we had booked out all of our Airbnbs. So our like exact train times weren't scheduled, but where we needed to be was scheduled. Yeah. And this poor guy like worked so hard for us he did. trying everything imaginable yeah. to get us from Lyon to Bordeaux. And finally he did it. He did. Um, he got us on a train uh, that made one stop and then went to Paris, mm-hmm. which is not Crazy. on the way to Bordeaux. <laughs> right. It's not way on the way. far north. And then from Paris to Bordeaux. And it was like one, a later train out. So we had to kind of wait around all day for that train. And it just put us so late into it was such a debacle. <laughs> And but that I would, guy was amazing. He another, was. Another reason that I love the people of Lyon. Yeah. He was super nice, super helpful, looked into so many yep. options before he finally found one that worked for us. And I mean, it, it would have been really easy for him to look at two or three options and say, sorry, sorry. you're going to have to take a bus or something like that mm-hmm. and send us away. But he didn't. He kept going and going and going and finally got us there. And we were just not ready for a holiday. And I, I would say look into the places you're going and just the dates that you're going and see if there's any holidays. Yeah. Because yeah. when the first time we went to Rome, if you're a list, if you're longtime listeners of the podcast, you'll recall that the first time we went to Rome, it was uh, Independence Day there. And it just meant that we got to be part of the celebration. It didn't really affect us much. But even on this trip, we were traveling um, over Easter weekend in the UK. And we didn't realize that both Friday and Monday would be bank holidays. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, just look at the countries you're going to, search your dates, and see if there's any holidays. And understand that they could cause turmoil for you yes because we also had strategically packed away a box full of stuff that Mm -hmm. we were like we are going to mail this and we're going to mail it here from Lyon and we're going to send it home to your mom your mom was going to receive it for us and it was going to have like my Doc Martin boots and like our coats and because we were kind of starting to get into the warmer weather and it was starting to be summertime so we were ready to release a lot of that stuff and send it home so we would have room for other fun things (laughs) and we'd very thoughtfully created this like box full of stuff yes and then we got to the post office even though we knew ascension day was happening at this point Mm -hmm. we still went to the post office to like mail off the all this stuff and realize the post office was closed and we were going to have to haul this box around with us <laughs> to Paris because apparently we were going to go back to Paris for a few minutes <laughs> and we had to take it all the way to Paris, wave hello to Disney World <laughs> right there at Paris and then come back down to southern France. Oh my goodness, it was hilarious, but um, it didn't feel hilarious at the moment. Yeah. I think that was one of those instances where we were like... We should film this, but we're so angry. And we didn't. We didn't film it at all. No, we didn't film it because it was just. We were so frustrated. It was just brutal. Yeah, it really was. But we eventually did make it to Bordeaux, which was an amazing place. It was fabulous. And we are going to tell you guys all about it in the next episode. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for that. Bordeaux is wine country. Oh my goodness. It was way more magical than I thought it was going to be. I didn't have huge expectations, but I would love to go back there. It was just pretty cool. Pretty awesome. For sure. Both Lyon and Bordeaux, we both scheduled just two nights in Mm -hmm. each place because we didn't know a lot about it. We were like, yeah, we're going to go, but we don't know if we're really going to like it. We're kind of taking a shot in the dark here. And we loved both places. Yes. Yeah, so good. For sure. So you guys tune in next week for that. Um, in the meantime, go online. Check out the video on YouTube. I think the video starts out with, um, we did some eating, you know, in the video. But it starts with me eating a fly while I'm trying to talk to the camera, <laughs> which is brilliant. I was like, oh my gosh, this is 
choking on this bug in my throat forever. But um, so once you get past that, though, you'll see real food and um, <laughs> including some really good ice cream that we have. And I don't know if we mentioned that the um, the bakeries and the ice cream was really good there. In yep. fact, our Airbnb host said that the ice cream we had was the best ice cream in France, in his opinion, in the whole country. Yeah. And it was pretty ridiculously awesome. So. Yeah, it, it was pretty great. And we got some footage of it uh, in the YouTube video. Yes, you were yeah. Like yours. It got you on a like a, a kick where you tried that same flavor like yes. 100 times trying Amaretta. to replicate it. Yeah, Amaretta Cherry. And then I realized, I was like, I really like this. And I was like, oh, I think this is a flavor that my Grandpa Joe really liked. My Grandpa <laughs> Joe and my Grandma Doris um, on, on the fight side. I'm pretty sure that they really liked it. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And so do I. That's so crazy. <laughs> but um, maybe a little sentimental. You guys check us out on social media. We are on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Um, you can follow us there, including where we are now, which we haven't been posting as much about. We are in the middle of a transitional period. But um, go there. Check us out. You'll see some fun short videos, too, that we have been really having a good time with. So. Um, um, it's a little different than what you might see in the long form YouTube videos and uh, it's pretty fun. Okay guys, we are going to let you go because life is short. Wonder well. <laughs>